and welcome to The Winning Mentality with me, Charlie Bosco. My guest today is in a sport that will not only be unknown to most of you, but perhaps even unappealing. Robbie Schoen is a professional cave explorer and photographer, and while to many of us the thought of spending days and even weeks exploring underground is terrifying, Robbie's huge passion for what he does is likely to inspire even the most cynical and claustrophobic amongst you. He's not just passionate, he's thoughtful and eloquent too. His description of hanging on a rope in a cave, like a spider on silk for example, is wonderfully evocative. He first went into a cave over 20 years ago and knew there and then that he'd found his calling. Now, two decades on, he's turned that calling into a career and travels the world exploring and photographing some of the most spectacular places on earth, the majority of which were created by glaciers in the last ice age but had never been seen by humans before. It's not all been plain sailing though and Robbie explains the sacrifices he's made, such as living for a month off black pepper sandwiches, and on a more poignant note he talks about risk, a difficult but necessary topic for any extreme sports person to consider. I suspect that few of you have ever really considered what caving is all about and what goes into exploring the underground world, but I was fascinated to hear about Robbie's experiences, his life story, and his philosophical and positive take on life. I'm sure you will be too. Robbie, welcome to The Winning Mentality, the first caver on the podcast. Thank you very much, Charlie. Yeah, I know it's not uh, such a popular hobby. A lot of people listening to this are probably thinking, why would you go caving? It's wet, it's cold, it's underground. What is the appeal of caving to you? Yeah, that's such a such a good question to start with. I um, I totally get it. I understand why to the regular person, caving is uh, perceived as something that you would never dream of doing. And I, I do understand that. I remember when I first went caving uh, 20 years ago in Sheffield, I was uh, studying art at university and a friend of mine got me, uh, persuaded me to go underground into a cave. And I obviously, I reluctantly, similar to, to, your, to your question, I, I didn't want to do it. I, I was inspired by rock climbing and I wanted to uh, take up rock climbing when I went to Sheffield. But he eventually persuaded me to go caving and we drove up to the Yorkshire Dales and went down a very, very famous, popular cave for beginners. And, and I remember the, the moment I went underground, being immersed in this alien world that I'd never experienced before in my life, um, feeling the adrenaline, and just the, the excitement was overpowering because we were faced with a short abseil immediately after entering the cave, and there was a waterfall, and the noise was really loud and powerful. And I just loved it. Obviously, I didn't expect to love it so much, but uh, for the rest of the trip, whilst we were underground, I was just running around like a child. It was it was so cool to be doing something that I'd never thought would be so so good and so exciting. And and it was immediate. I remember coming out of the cave thinking this was something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I don't know how, but I, I, I wanted more of it. So it was mainly the atmosphere, the ambience of being in the cave, the otherworldliness of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, I was there with a friend from uh, from the course, and we were we were with guides, more experienced cavers. So I I knew we were safe in that respect, um, but it was being surrounded by this completely alien alien world that I'd never experienced before. I'd never seen pictures, and I did not know what what existed beneath the surface of the of Earth. So. After your first caving experience, you said you knew straight away this is something you wanted to do. Did you go out and buy all the equipment, join every caving club? Where did it develop? Yeah, that's, that, 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 that's quite interesting, actually, when you say, did you go out and buy all the, all the equipment? I remember, because I, like I said, I was a student in Sheffield, so, so money was a little bit tight. And of course, what little money I did have went on tuition fees and rent and, and things for the, for the course. But, but I, I also knew at the same time that I wasn't going to be doing caving for five minutes. It was going to be something that I was going to do uh, for a long, long time. And the equipment can be quite expensive to get, to get really professional, good quality gear. Uh, there was one particular oversuit that we wear, um, especially in the Yorkshire Dales of England where the caves are really wet. The oversuit's made out of PVC, a PVC uh, plastic material. And I remember it costing about £100 
back in 1999 and I, I, I worked out that if I, if I lived off pepper sandwiches for two weeks, I, uh, I could save enough money and afford uh, one of these really professional, spectacular oversuits. So, so that's what I did. I spent, I spent two weeks just eating pepper sandwiches. <laughs> Hold on, talk me through it. Are we talking about the vegetable pepper? No, no. Are we talking about We're talking pepper? about freshly ground black pepper <laughs> onto, <laughs> onto, onto uh, pieces of bread. Did the budget stretch to butter as well? No, no, Charlie. No, no, sorry. <laughs> so that was my first question. What type of pepper are we talking about? Second thing, <laughs> for people that don't know much about caving, what is the equipment? You've said you, meet, you need an oversuit. It's quite a hostile environment, a cave. What else do you need? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you you need to be warm first of all. So we would wear uh, a material called fleece, and we would cover the whole of our body in this. The, 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 it's it's similar to like a child's baby grow, like a romper or, suit, or, or yeah, or, or a onesie exactly. Um, made out of fleece, so that would be your first layer. That's going to be your warm layer, and then you want to keep that dry. So over the top, you wear a waterproof oversuit made out of cordura or like I was saying earlier, PVC plastic uh, and then of course you need your helmet over your head to protect your head because because things fall out of the ceiling and you can also bash your head on the ceiling whilst you're crawling through smaller places you need a good light because obviously caves are dark there's no light down there at all so you need a good waterproof head torch uh, that runs off batteries um, and then if you're doing anything vertical where the cave uh, drops down a big shaft or you have to climb up a rope, you would use uh, an, an SRT kit, it's called, and that stands for Single Rope Technique. So that's all the mechanical piece of equipment to go up and down a rope, and the rope itself. Yeah, absolutely. So what one person would install the rope itself uh, using bolts uh, or natural anchors wrapped around stalagmites or boulders, um, and then each each person... Each caver would have his own personal SRT kit so that when he gets to the rope, he can just jump on or she can just jump on and, uh, and climb up or, or abseil down. And again, to the uninitiated, it's hard to see where the progression is in caving. If you play soccer, you want to score more goals. If you are doing athletics, you want to go faster, jump further, whatever it might be. Where's the progression in caving? Where's the skill and where is the aspiration when you take it up okay yeah so 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 caving is very similar to rock climbing and the mountaineering world in in england where where i first started caving we have regular caves which are, are, are extremely impressive don't get me wrong they're they're spectacular but they're of a moderate size similar to the mountains that we have in england they're they're cool and they're spectacular and uh, and you can climb them climb them in a day which is great, and, and this is a, a really nice playground to, to learn, to cut your teeth. But, but to progress in the caving world, to become more experienced and more proficient at uh, exploring caves, exploring deep caves, for example, you would have to leave the shores of England and go over to the Alps, just like rock climbing, um, climbing mountains around Chamonix. Uh, it, it, it's the same in caving. You know, there are deep caves in France, uh, and Spain and the Pyrenees and the Picos. And then eventually you would progress again further, like climbing a mountaineering where they go to the Himalayas and Tibet. We would do the same. We would go to areas like China, Vietnam, Malaysia, generally uh, areas where there's limestone uh, surrounded by uh, heavily vegetated lands. So like the tropics, these are, these, are, these are the places where the big caves are formed on planet Earth. Why limestone? Is it because it's the softest rock? Yeah, and it allows water to seep through it. So, so you, you, the caves are formed, mostly the caves in, in, on Earth are formed in limestone. And like I just mentioned, if, it, if the surface is heavily vegetated and there's a lot of soil, a lot of, of deep soils, the water that falls on the, on the surface becomes acidic because it picks up acidity through the, uh, through the vegetation and seeps through the limestone. And because it's slightly acidic, it erodes the rock a lot more so than any other, uh, er any other areas in the world. And then these, these giant caves are formed. So as you progress to these bigger caves, m moving beyond England and the caves of England, is the skill in the judgment, is that really what you're developing, is understanding how the cave system works, 
how to negotiate through it, which end might be a dead end, which end might go. And also, what's, what's the goal? You go to a new cave, what's, what's the goal? Is it to reach the end of the system? So to, an to answer that, the last part of your question first, caving is, is split up in, into several areas. There's a few people who are interested in only sport caving. So their, 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 their excitement is, is gained from just descending into a cave, getting down to the bottom, uh, rigging all the ropes themselves, and then on the way back up, they de-rig all the ropes and then leave the cave uh, without anything inside the cave, anything left behind. And that's, that's up to them. That's great. And they're what we call sport cavers. Okay, so there's no ex ex exploration involved. But then there are other people, uh, more like myself at the very beginning, who were interested in exploration. So I was fascinated by the fact that you could go into a cave, go to the end of the cave, and especially in, in, in caves in England, you'd have to dig the rocks and the rubble out from the passage that's blocking the passage. So as the glacier uh, went over this part of the rock, it would have pushed in all the sediment at the, on, at the base of the glacier into all of these holes, into all of these caves. And now the glacier is gone and, um, and we want to explore the caves. They're full of rocks and mud. So, so what I was fascinated by was the, the fact that you can dig your way through a passage that's, uh, that, that exists. It's, it's right there but it's full of the rocks, so you dig it all out, and then if you're lucky, you can break out on the other side and discover a cave that's never been seen before, never been illuminated by light, and you can walk for miles in this beautiful gallery. If you're lucky, it's full of formations and crystals, and, and then you come back the way you've came, get to the surface, and go and tell all your friends what you found in the pub. The judgment element, from personally, from my, my experience, was gained by exploring caves with with certain people so there are other people who um because obviously caves can be dangerous um i think we should we should probably mention that that if you're if you're in a cave and you've not got the experience or you're or you're with people who who necessarily don't respect caves the way they should be uh, respected there there's a there's a more risk that an accident could happen so i was I, I was aware of this, um, and I, I, I kind of uh, veered towards people who were very experienced, very capable, very professional, very competent people, um, and I tried to, tried to stick with them and help them uh, with, with some of their projects and, and, and only really go caving with these people. And I feel like over, I don't know, the first, certainly the first five years, I uh, I just absorbed all of their knowledge um, and, and and just like took on board how they how they traverse through a cave safely. And risk is a part of cave. It's a part of any extreme sport. How do you deal psychologically with risk? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, and and obviously I, I, we can all answer it differently. Um, because risk risk is in everybody's life. Depends how you. How, what what you do and and how you how you deal with it. So you said earlier you want to go came with people who are professional and sensible and take it seriously. There must have been or there must be incidents along the way where you or other people do something daft and it must just just snap you back into how dangerous it can be. Yeah, that's that that's true and it it, it can be the case. Um and 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 often it would be these people who who are professional uh, and competent people who, because they're pushing the boundaries there. And yeah, I, I remember one one example where we were in a cave in in Derbyshire, uh, a cave called Titan, which uh, is currently the largest vertical shaft in the UK. We, it was found on New Year's Day in 1999. And it's a very, very vertical cave. It's about 146 meters in height. And it's shaped just like an egg timer. So it goes narrow in the middle. Exactly. It pinches in, in the middle, where there's a very small ledge all the way around where you can access a streamway, uh, an active streamway that comes in halfway down. But it's a beautiful, beautiful cave. All the walls are vertical. 
up in the upper parts of the cave, uh, the walls are full of calcite, uh, a white flowstone material um, that's, that basically forms all the big stalagmites and stalactites, the cave formations that we find. Uh, and it's it's spectacular. Um, and back in, when was it? 2000, I think, yeah, 2000, I first went into this cave and was absolutely blown away by the size and the space. And, and the, the, there was a rope that hung from the roof all the way down through the middle, nowhere near the walls. But it, I remember being at the top and looking down, thinking, wow, this is spectacular. Wouldn't this be cool to take a photograph? And of course, I, I'd already got into, gotten into photography at this point. Uh, and that was kind of like my biggest ambition at the time. I wanted to, to, to get good enough in cave photography that I could take on the challenge of photographing uh, Titan, the cave, from the roof dome, from the very, very uppest, upper, uppermost part of the cave, looking straight the way down through the, through the narrowing and all the way down to the floor. And over the next three years, we, uh, we went into Titan and we would, um, we would be lowered out over, over the space, over the void, uh, because the, the roof dome was about 12 meters out away from the ledge where we could access from the surface. So hold on a second. So the rope comes down from the top and then it's 12 meters horizontally out to a ledge. Exactly. Yeah. So you, you, you would have to either be lowered out into the void before you could then climb up to get into the roof dome. But at the time we thought this was uh, this wasn't so much fun. We thought it would be more challenging and more exciting to uh, to take in all of the slack into our descending device uh, and jump. So you're going to swing from the ledge out into the middle of the cave where the rope was hanging, then out the far side like a, like a pendulum. Exactly, about 130 meters off the floor. So it, it, it was terrifying. And um, I mean, I, I didn't go first. A friend of mine went first and, and he jumped off. And I remember watching him and he'd, he'd locked off his descender. So his arms were outspread and he was, he was screaming all the way as he pendulumed right the way across the void in total blackness. All I could see was his head torch. Uh, and he loved it and he was he said it was so much fun and he must have pendulum back into maybe 30 40 times before uh, he finally came to a stop so any thoughts that you would get your mate to just gently let the rope out and ease you into the middle that were gone now yeah no no I, that was not going to happen I, I i definitely had to do exactly the same as him uh and and it was it was it was a scary thought uh I, but I, I i did the same i, I took in the rope i i uh, installed it into my descending device. I locked my descending device off, maybe double, double, triple checked it, made sure it was all super safe. And then, um, and then I jumped off myself. And yeah, I remember flying across the void, 130 meters off the floor, total darkness. I could feel the wind passing me by as I was gliding through the, through the void, through the cave. But then on the way back, uh, I must have because I must have jumped off at a slightly different angle to, uh, to him because on the way back, the rope caught the rock a little bit higher up and sent me flying off into a slightly different direction. And then, of course, this happened again and again and again. Every time I pendulumed across, the, the rope caught uh, some, some piece of rock higher up where there was an overhang. Uh, and I thought, oh, no, this is, this is not good. This, this could be the end because... When a, when a rope, um, and this was something that I learned actually when I did my rope access qualification, my level one qualification, they showed me that uh, that a, a rope that's under tension can be cut with a shoelace by using friction. And So if you've got a loaded rope and you rub a shoelace against it repeatedly, it'll, it'll yeah. cut. Exactly, yeah. And so I was aware of this and I thought, oh my goodness, this rope is not being rubbed by a shoelace. This rope is being rubbed by a rock. And, and unbeknown to me, it could be, could be a really sharp rock. So every time I pendulumed across towards the point where it rubbed, I thought, oh my goodness, this could be the end. And I would, the rope would be cut and I would fall 135 meters all the way down to the pile of boulders at the bottom. And this was terrifying. This really was, was a very frightening moment. But eventually, after about 30 or 40 swings across, the rope, and I came to a, to a stop and I remember very, very slowly climbing up the rope and I got to the point where the rope had been rubbing against the rock 
and there was a, a two or three inch abrasive point where it was all fluffy. The sheath of the rope um, wasn't cut through, thankfully, but uh, it was very, very fluffy and very soft. Once I'd, once I'd gone past this rub point, I remember picking it up and feeling it in my hands and it was extremely soft. And, and yeah, I don't know how many more swings uh, the rope would have would have withstood before it finally cut and when i got to the top my friend said to me he said oh my goodness you know i could see what was happening but unfortunately i was also too far away and there was nothing i could do because it was happening so fast and and there was no way he could have stopped it so he was also waiting for you know one of these swings it would snap the rope and i would fall but it didn't so and and after that it was you know we never did that again and uh, i had a new respect for for caves and not doing stupid things um but now now we're 20 years later so now i um i don't necessarily think about risk as much as maybe i should do but i am aware of it and um, without being too complacent i think i think you need to have some element of risk being aware of the risk because if if you you want to be you want to be in the right line of 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 sort of danger really um, and I think being being almost scared, having a fear of things, keeps you on that right right line. It's when you get too complacent, then you can uh, you can go over the line, and then of of course accidents can happen. It's interesting with some extreme sports, they get more dangerous as you pursue them further because of situations you find yourself in get more dangerous inherently. If you start skiing on a nice safe piste. It's a relatively safe activity and there's a ski patrol to come and pick you up if you fall over. But as you push it into ski mountaineering and then exploratory ski mountaineering, the risk increases despite your experience and skill also increasing. Is caving like that? Yes and no. From my point of view, no. Because when I was younger, I was fitter uh, and stronger. And obviously, as a, as a late you know, teenager, early 20s, I... I, I I got a thrill out of risk. I got a thrill out of uh, things being more dangerous. So I would do more stupid, more crazy things uh, and push the risk level. Whereas now, uh, because I'm more into photography, the way I explore a cave is a lot more uh, easygoing, more sedate. I'm not racing around cave like I used to because A, I'm not fit enough, uh, but B, I don't, I don't necessarily need to do that with, with the photography. And where, what is the main source of risk in a cave? People might not be aware of what the risks really are. The, the risks of, of being in a cave are, well, I mean, the weather can, can have a huge impact on, on how a cave behaves because obviously if it, if it rains a lot, for example, then uh, the cave can flood depending on what, what type of cave it is and what the catchment for that particular cave system is. So like you know we would um we would check the weather forecast before we go into into a cave where we know has an active section and when i when i say active i mean uh water is currently con- you know continuously forming the cave where there are other cave passages around the world which are what we would call fossil caves so they're they're extinct of all the water that formed them so they're super safe you know they're, 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 there's very little risk and danger that you you're likely to come across in those caves and how long are you spending underground in one go? What's the longest you've ever spent underground? It varies. Um, most of my, my, my time underground now is, is, is through photography. So, so a lot of the trips can, can vary from a few hours uh, right up to 14 days, which is the longest we spent in a cave in Vietnam. This is without a break. You don't come to the surface for that 14 days. Yes and no. The cave that I'm talking about um, is, is a cave called Han Son Dong in Vietnam, and it's it, it's arguably the most uh, the largest cave passage in the world. It's it's spectacular. It's a beautiful cave, and between the two main entrances, there are two skylights that come down that break the cave passage, um, and we we did spend quite a lot of time camping around these these skylights these portals where light came in so it wasn't like i i didn't see daylight for 14 days but when you say camping you're camping inside the cave absolutely we are camping inside the cave what's that like i mean what can you how much stuff can you take how luxurious is it and how illuminated is it i mean have you got a a beatbox and an ipod down there what's it look like a cave camp (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. First of all, we do take music. We definitely take a music system with us. I I remember one one trip we did in Malaysia. I think it was in 2005. One of the one of the team members um, had some very small speakers connected to his iPod, and uh, we put it in the root in the top of his rucksack. And he was in the middle of the group, so we all had music as we were traversing through the cave to the campsite. And and camping inside caves it can be desperate. I mean, it can be really really tough, especially if it's a cold, wet cave somewhere somewhere like in Austria. Or, or or Russia, you know the, these parts of the world is very very cold and and not a nice place to spend spend a few nights. But mostly where I've been camping underground in caves are in areas of the world where it's very very warm on the surface, like in Malaysia, China, Vietnam, and the camping is delightful. We 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 would try and find a an area of flat, dry, sandy ground where we can all um, lay out our roll mats and sleeping bags. Um, somewhere where there's a small stream so we can get uh, a constant supply of water. And yeah, I mean, I mean, I, to be honest, I, I have definitely had some of my most peaceful, uh, relaxing night's sleep underground in a cave. So generally you are sleeping on the ground, you're not. Do you take hammocks? Is that an option? We, we, we do take hammocks, but not for camping underground. Underground, we would camp on the floor on somewhere sandy and soft, but we would use the hammocks on the surface in the rainforest to keep us off the ground where all the creepy crawlies are. And people are probably thinking now, well, how do you get all the kit down there? It must be an incredibly physical process, a multi-day caving trip. That's right, that's right. And of course, we have to carry everything in ourselves, all the food, um, all the pan sets and the stoves and all the camping equipment. And then, of course, on top of that, I have to carry all the camera gear and all the lighting gear because, like I mentioned earlier, caves are pitch black. There is no light down there at all. You really cannot see your hand in front of your face until it's touching your nose. You are just... It's an, it's an incredible space to take pictures, to make pictures for photography. It's beautiful. Well, now seems the logical time to mention that you are a professional cave photographer how did that happen you finished university by now i assume a completely obsessive caver where did the photography passion come from and how did you merge the two so to take you back 20 years ago i uh, I, I went to sheffield like i mentioned earlier to, to to study art it was a fine art course uh, i was very much interested in painting huge canvases giant canvases in oil and acrylic uh, and it and it was great. I mean, it, it it was mostly a hobby, to be honest. I won't lie. Um, it was it was something that I was good at, and I really really enjoyed it. And and it took me all the way to a degree course. But I at the back of my mind, I did know that it was it was never going to be something that I I I could do permanently for the rest of my life. I I just didn't I just didn't feel like it was it was wholesome enough and and rewarding enough for me. Um, but I did want to do something creative. And it was, like I mentioned, when I went into a cave for the very first time, I was just inspired by the the landscape, by the environment. And that's when I realized that I had to do something creative inside the cave. Uh, And practically, it didn't make sense to do anything with painting. So I went downstairs at the university to where the dark room was and where the photography department, and I asked if I could borrow a camera. This is presumably before digital days. Absolutely. This is before digital, so it was all film cameras. I used to take these cameras into the nearby caves uh, outside of Sheffield in the Peak District around Castleton. There's a very, very famous cave called Peak Cavern, which I would go in two or three times a week, take some pictures. Uh, and like we mentioned just now, it, it was all film, so we didn't know what the photograph looked like. So I would, I would take with me a little sketchbook, a little notepad, and write down all the settings, all the the settings on the camera, the ISO, the aperture, the shutter speed. But also, I would I would write down more technical information: how far away the flash is from the wall, for example. What's coating the wall? Is it something uh, that absorbs light, like mud, brown, wet mud, or is it something that reflects light, like water on shiny uh, rock surfaces? Because all this helps um, helps make the photograph and you then learn from it and you can understand how much light to, to throw at the wall. Because to the casual observer, taking a photo in a cave is extraordinarily difficult thing to do because 
most cameras come with a basic flash, but that is not going to cut it in a big chamber. What is the uh, equipment you use? You mentioned then how far away the flash is from the from the wall, I think you said. It's an external flash. It's a separate piece of equipment. What are we talking about when we talk about your kit list for a, a trip down a cave now? Yeah, so, so this is something that I learned very, very quickly um, not to use the flash that's on, on the camera because it's so close to the lens. And what the flash does is it just lights up all the particles of, of moisture and dust. Anything that's right in front of the lens gets illuminated by the flash that's on board. So I, I, I learned that pretty much on the first trip. Of all the people you would think to use the flash on a camera. Yeah, no, no. We, we, okay, photographers we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't do that. We would, we would use the hot shoe on the camera to, to trigger multiple flashes around the cave. Just explain what the hot shoe is. The, yeah, sorry. The hot, the hot shoe on the camera is the, 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 the silver, the metal uh, attachment that's, that sits on top of the prism on, on top of the camera. Okay, so, so you slide in uh, an external flash gun on top. So yeah, so like I, like I said, that we, we would not use that flash that's on the camera. Um, so I, I, I had to buy uh, different light sources, different types of flash. Um, and then for the larger caves, we use what's, uh, what's called a flash bulb. It's a, it's a bulb filled with magnesium wire wool. Uh, and they are extremely powerful, extremely bright, but they're one use only. So once you've used it once, you have to throw it away and uh, insert another bulb into the flash gun to have another go. So you, so yeah, we, for, the, for the really big rooms, the really big chambers, we need quite a lot of these flash bulbs. It's funny actually, because a couple of minutes ago when you were talking about the change from analog to digital photography, I was thinking, this sounds such a long process. You have to write down all the camera settings. You can't just take a picture of the camera settings on your phone and then check what the photo looks like. It's a much more drawn out process than digital photography. But there's still an element of that long drawn out process because you're taking down magnesium bulbs that you can only use once. Yeah, yeah. I mean, did to be honest, digital photography has been brilliant, absolutely superb, especially to um, a cave photographer like myself who, who really reaps the benefits from being able to see the image straight after you've taken the photograph because then you don't need to go back on a separate, separate trip with all that equipment and on all the, the support from the assistants that, that have to hold the lights around the cave. Uh, and, and I remember when I first bought a digital camera after about six years of using film cameras. Yeah, I mean, it, it literally just changed my, my world completely and helped me no ends. But we still have to take in all this equipment. We still need lots and lots of lights. And, and even today, only a few, a few days ago, in fact, I ordered another stash of these flash bulbs for my next trip because I know that the caves that we're going to are so big uh, there's just nothing else on the market that we can use that generates that amount, that amount of light but can be fired with a 9-volt battery. Let's just take a step back. Before we talk about your next trip, I'm interested how you got into doing this as a job. So you started taking photos down the cave, so you, you've covered you are now a, a passionate photographer, a passionate caver. It's quite a big leap to being a professional cave photographer. Yeah, so after, after a few months, maybe a few years actually, of practicing cave photography, I, uh, I realized that it was something that I, I just had to do. I had to do all the time. I didn't want this to be a hobby. I didn't want this to be uh, something that I just did in the summer. Whilst I did another job, I did other things I was not interested in. So I, uh, I, I quickly realized that there are several magazines, several uh, outlets around the world that assign uh, photographers to cover stories about, um, about caving and, and cave exploration, such as National Geographic magazine, Geo magazine, uh, Red Bull as well in Austria are interested in caves and exploration. And it was like a dream almost that, uh, that I wanted to work for these magazines eventually. Uh, and hopefully my work would be good enough and recognized by the editors of these magazines. So I, I, I remember pestering uh, editors at National, National Geographic and, 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 and assisting other photographers who worked for National Geographic because I wanted to learn from them, learn their techniques and, and try and climb up the ladder, so to speak, to hopefully one day becoming a, a full-time a full professional photographer for magazines like National Geographic. 
But along the way, you've got to earn a living. What were you doing at this time? Did you go down the road of a normal job to start with? Did you work in an office for a while? How did you pay your way while you are climbing the ladder? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a good the good a good question, Charlie. And I, I mean, a lot of this I I always turn to and and say is look because because as as I was growing as a as a cave explorer, um, a lot of people who I was caving with worked in the industry of the, the rope access industry. So like professional abseilers, you know, the type of people that you see abseiling down skyscrapers, uh, cleaning windows or, or abseiling down bridges, painting um, bridges and all this. And, and all the techniques for this industry derived from caving and cave exploration. So so one of the guys who uh, trained me up actually for my IRATA, my Industrial Rope Access Trade Association Level 1, was a cave explorer and a friend of mine who had just been to Malaysia on a caving expedition. So, so a lot of things kind of happened at the same time. I, uh, I, I got my level one qualification to work in the industry. In the rope access industry. In the rope access industry, yeah. They, that, that helped pay for um, expeditions to far-flung places like Malaysia where I could practice cave photography in the biggest caves in the world, the ones that are so spectacular that... Uh, that uh, are going to draw attention to to people like the um, picture editors at National Geographic magazine. And tell us about the the rope access industry. It, it must be quite a fun thing to do. We'll go back to caving in just a second, but I bet it's a fun thing to do. You must have cleaned windows on some famous buildings. Yeah, yeah. The rope access industry is great fun, and I've got some fun, fun memories. I did it for ten years. Uh, I got my level one in the year two thousand and soon got my level three qualification, which meant you can uh, supervise a team of, uh, team of people. And so that's the top of the ladder, isn't it, level three? It, it, it's the top of the IRATA ladder, but then from there, many, many people get their offshore qualification and they go and work on the oil rigs. Um, and you can get other certificates uh, for welding, for grinding, for confined spaces, which I never actually got, surprisingly, because you would have thought uh, confined You'd space. You'd have cleaned up on the <laughs> confined space exam. Yeah, no, it, it, never, it, never, it never appealed, actually, to, uh, to, to work in the industrial rope access to industry as a, as con in confined space. I, I, I kind of saved that for the weekends. <laughs> That's brilliant. You like natural confined spaces, but not man-made ones. You're very picky about your confined spaces. <laughs> yeah, but it, but it was good. I mean, and all the guys that we worked with were either cavers or climbers. So the weeks were brilliant. You know, it, it never really felt like work because we were having some great conversations about climbing around the world or caving around the world. And, and when you work with like-minded people, the time seems to fly by. And so once you're in the rope access industry, where was your photography career at this stage? Were you thinking about just doing rope access as a career or were you, did you always have your eyes on the prize? Yeah, eyes on the prize. Uh, no, I, yes and no. Um, it was great fun um, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. But yes, to some extent, I was always thinking that it was never going to be a full-time career because also it's, it's very, very hard work. You know, it's very physical. Uh, it's, it's certainly a young man's game um, because you're, you're constantly sat in a harness swinging around on buildings in all weathers. I mean, a lot of jobs we did was, was that we're out on, the, on, on rail, railway line cuttings, de-vegging all the vegetation that overhangs bridges and stuff like this. And we would do it in the winter and it was tough. It was really, really tough. So that side of it, I didn't, I didn't want to do it in, in later life. Uh, but also I had this burning desire for, to be a cave photographer. So, so that kind of helped as well uh, push me harder to, uh, to, to achieve that. And was there a big break, or did, did this come gradually, the move from industrial rope access to being a cave photographer? It, uh, it there wasn't there wasn't really a big break, so to speak. Uh, it was a constant battle um, for many many years. Um, my work improved as time went by. It was certainly not good enough at the very beginning. I made many, many mistakes. Um, but there, I suppose there was one There was one expedition in 2006. We went to Papua New Guinea. Uh, it was a National Geographic sponsored expedition. And they sent over uh, an American photographer. His name is Stephen Alvarez, who's, who remains a good friend. And Stephen still works for National Geographic magazine. Um, and he came and photographed our three-month expedition in Papua New Guinea. And I, up until this point, I'd never met anybody so high up in the cave photography world. 
uh, and, and yes, meeting Stephen was a big break and I made it very clear from, from day one pretty much that I, I, I wanted his job. <laughs> so what was the first time you went from working the ropes and paying for your own expeditions to someone booking the flight for you and paying you when you got home. You actually got paid to go on a Yeah, trip. so I, I did a few I did a few expeditions uh, where I assisted photographers. So I wasn't actually the photographer, but these were these were assignments that were paid by the magazine, by National Geographic magazine, uh, for me to go. So all my expenses were paid and I, 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 I was paid a small wage to be the photographer's assistant. And then, so that's like the bridge between paying for your own expeditions out of your own pocket to becoming a photographer where you actually have an assistant who, uh, who, who helps you. You obviously been quite clever about this because I guess one of the big pluses about the rope access industry is that you can have huge amounts of time off. You can't have a normal job and take three months off. That's true. I mean, you say quite clever. It was, I, I never realized this at the time. It was never a conscious decision to, to do that. But um, I, I just wanted to, I mean, I kind of, I kind of, one of the main things that I like about caving is, uh, is swinging around in a harness in, in total space. So you're nowhere near the wall. You're like a spider on, a, on, on some silk, con, you know, constructing your web. You, um, it, it's such an adrenaline rush, especially in total darkness. And I love that. I love that about caving. And I think that's one of the reasons why I got into the rope access industry, because you, you're doing this. Uh, on skyscrapers in London or Leeds, Manchester, wherever, um, and it's such a cool feeling. And of course, you know you're getting paid for it. So, so why wouldn't you want to take up that? And then, yes, of course, like you say, um, if you want to take four weeks off to go on an expedition, you can come back to that same job if it's a long-running job, and uh, and 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 sort of take carry on from where you left off. And so, at what point were you able to leave rope access behind and be a full-time K photographer, which you are now? That is your only job mm -hmm. that's that's true it is it is my only um form of income uh when did that happen good question because it, it, it's been the last 20 years has been kind of like a seesaw so so if you imagine when you start the seesaw one of you is sat at the bottom and the other one sat in the air and then as you go through you slowly literally swap those roles around and it's constantly changing but the point where I kind of didn't do any rope access work in the year and it was all K photography would probably be at the point when we emigrated to Austria. Uh, and I, I was forced in a way to, to, to commit to K photography, to, to, to take that jump where, no, this is not going to, there's not going to be, um, you know, like a soft cushion where I can fall back with the rope access industry. Because there isn't the work in Austria. That, well, there is the work in Austria. I mean, the, the, there's the, there are companies that put up the uh, the chairlifts and um, cable cars, and they 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 work with rope access technicians. So I I could, if I tried really hard, I could I could get into to this industry. But um, I think at that point in my cave photography career, I was close to to uh, committing to cave photography. I'd, I'd assisted two, three uh, National Geographic photographers. I I'd, I'd met editors. At National Geographic. If I didn't do it then, I don't think I would have done it. So maybe you just needed that bit of pressure. I think it was that. I think it was moving to Austria. Um, and also, I've, I have noticed that um, here in Europe, on the continent, they're more, they're more, the, the, the magazine market, the magazine is, industry are more open to cave exploration articles than than magazines in in the uk um that you know there's there's a few but 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 it's not enough to 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 build a, a career out of you know I, I kind of needed to to branch out and, and meet um other other magazines in in europe i ask about when the tip came and if there was a magic moment or anything because i'd love to think there are people listening to this in their teens or early 20s or maybe even later in life who would love to do something for a living and can't see a way into it and that's why it's always so interesting to hear how long the journey took was there a key moment what what did it take and in your case it seemed like it was just persistence and that's not to denigrate your skill level but it seemed like you just knew you wanted to do caving knew you wanted to do photography and banged your head against a wall until you were good at both yeah ab absolutely it was certainly persistence 
Um, I've I've made so many so many sacrifices. Well, they're not really sacrifices because it, it, you know it was always cave photography for me. Um, but and, and I I feel like the journey itself, even though it's taken twenty years, it's been an amazing experience. You know, I mean, nothing has been too daunting where i would think no this is not going to happen you know I, I need to i need to give up and and take something else up it was always going to be well e even if i don't make it it doesn't really matter because you know you, you can spend a lifetime trying to become s something but actually when you look back what you've achieved over 50 years of trying to trying to be successful in cave photography for example it doesn't matter because you know you, you've had so many ex cool experiences and you've met so many amazing people along the way and now that you've, if you like, arrived, I guess you never really feel like you've arrived, but you are a professional cave photographer. How does it work? People might be thinking, well, how many photos of caves do we need? They understand, they understand you could be a, a sports photographer and you go to the game every Saturday and you take the pictures. But uh, in terms of caves, what is the nature of most of your work and how does it come to be commissioned? Okay, so, for, so if, if we start this, we could say um, that all the surface of the planet has been photographed or seen from space okay so we know that we know what the, the surface of the earth looks like only five percent of the world's oceans have been explored there's still 95 percent unexplored which i i think is absolutely amazing there's so the potential for for so many new species of, of wildlife down there but caves we have no idea we have no idea what's what's been what's still to be found, because you actually have to physically go inside, and and discover it. We know how much limestone there is in, on Earth, but we don't know um, how many more caves are yet to be found. And there might be many many caves that we never find because the entrance is too small, or, or maybe they don't even have an entrance. They could be like a geode, where they're just a void in the rock, and that. Is, is the rush that I get, you know, I, I'm drawn to the fact that there's still so much you know, ex to explore in caves and photograph um, that I'll never get tired of, of going back to uh, going underground into a cave and taking photographs, even though, you know, one cave might look similar to another cave. Uh, it's a different cave. And if it's only been explored for, for the, you know, for the first time only yesterday, then it needs documenting. It, need, it there needs to be photographs of these places or, and maps as well. So generally, is it you that suggests the trip? So you work a lot for National Geographic, amongst other people. Do you say to them, there's this cave I think we should explore, here's what it will cost, and here's what I think the photos might look like, and here's why you should pay for it? Or generally, do you get an experienced caver coming to you and saying, Robbie, I want to do this trip and I need a photographer? Yeah, it, it's a mixture of all these things. Um, at the, in the early days, it was very much a case of I would... I would I would write proposals. I would come up with ideas. Uh, I would I would nag um, other cave explorers to take me along as their as their official photographer. Um, but yeah, as you become more um, established, then then magazines will come to you and say, oh, you know, hey, Robbie, we need we need somebody who's who's who, who's a specialist in low light, or or you know, a lot of this assignment is is maybe underground in pyramids in Egypt, for example. Then, uh, then we, we we want you know we'd like you to come along because you know you have the the, the skill set for that. That must be a nice feeling after so long of wanting to do it when someone emails you and says, "Hey, Robbie, you fancy?" Yeah, of course. Fancy and, going and here? I say pyramids, and this 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 one is is true. We went to uh, to went to Egypt, and then Sudan, a few years ago to to shoot a story about um, the black pharaohs. Um, and all the pyramids that are in uh, in Sudan, all around the Nile River, and it was amazing. It was so cool. I mean, don't forget, you know, the the, the skill set is the same, and we're we're lighting these pyramids just as we would in a cave, but to actually go and experience these amazing places, man-made structures like the pyramids and at, at, at Giza in in Cairo, just unbelievable. One thing that strikes me, chatting to you, and also when I came in, we're in your house in Austria right now. You could see all the books on the wall. It seems like the experience above ground on an expedition is also a big part of it. Yeah, I mean that, that that's very true. You know, we, we get a bit carried away talking about caves all the time, but a lot of these expeditions, we do spend a lot of time, if not most of the time, on the surface. Um, 
and yeah my my experiences have mostly been in the tropics in the rainforests of malaysia and vietnam and china um and living living in these really harsh environments is very very tough because the temperatures are so hot 100 percent humidity so we have to look after all the equipment in uh, in watertight airtight containers with silica gel so they don't uh, fog up or, or or a fungal growth happens on the lenses i remember one one time we had that problem with one of the glass with in one of the optics the some fu some fungal growth appeared so maintaining um a, a good working equipment is it can be very very challenging and also looking after your body because you know you when you're live when you're exposed to these horrible nasty environments like uh, like the tropics where where it's so hot and it's so harsh and the ground is very very unforgiving there's lots of creatures that want to eat you and bite you um it's very very tough a lot of the time i was just glad to get underground and get away from everything on the surface one really nice thing about all these trips is and just how nature has put the caves is that they all seem to be in interesting places as well is the cultural side of an expedition something you i suppose you can't focus on it the cave has to be the focus but is that a big part of the trip for you no it is it's, it's an amazing opportunity to go and travel the world and meet um these these amazing people that that live in some of the places that we go to i remember a couple of years ago we went to venezuela uh to explore caves in in a couple of tipuis so the tabletop mountains that uh, that that stand up out out of the the, the Grand Sabana plains, um, and we we uh, we stayed in a local village next to one of these tapuis, um, and the team employed uh, a few members of the village to help with the logistics and and, and help um, cut things like helipads and small trails through the forest and it's really nice to uh, to 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 mix and interact with these these people because in in some ways you know we fly in and uh, we just land and and turn up and we we un unravel all our gear the laptops and you know generators and cameras and whatnot and of course they don't have all of these luxuries that we have in today's western world um but then it's such a privilege to go and explore the caves um, with them and show them things like the maps and the photographs and and you can see the excitement in their face especially the children that are there they, they, they realize that the, you know that the, the tapui the mountain that they've been based next to for generations contains these amazing caves and it's it's really cool to interact with them like that and there's also a huge logistical element to a, an expedition isn't there you just mentioned about cutting helipads how do you generally access caves is it normally helicopters because I guess a lot of them are quite remote. You might not even know how you're going to get to them when you arrive in the country. Absolutely. And, and certainly for that expedition I just mentioned in Venezuela, the only way onto the top, unless you're a super duper famous rock climber uh, and you can scale the cliff, is, is using a helicopter. And, and for four weeks we, uh, we chartered a helicopter to, to get up there. But that's not always the case. You don't need to, uh, to splash out on, on, on things like helicopters. We um, we would we would hike up with all the gear. Uh, if if there's if there if there are people there who have uh, animals like donkeys, we would employ these 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 people to to um, to help getting all the gear up to the base camp. And the base camp is 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 often within an hour or two's walk to the cave entrance or or a short climb up up the side of a mountain. You know. Yeah, we, we, we wouldn't we wouldn't be too far away um, because we want to be able to access the cave and get out within a day unless we were camping inside the cave. Uh, but even so, that distance between the base camp and the cave entrance is never more than never more than an hour and a half or, or two hours, something like this. And I know you're a quite humble chap. You might not like this question, but for people who are thinking, oh, this sounds good, but how much time do, would I need to devote to it? What does an average year look like for you? And can you list, say, everywhere you've been in the past two years? Uh, yeah, it's funny, actually, but I had to apply for a visa to Russia a few months ago. And one of the questions was, uh, can you please list all the countries you've been to in the last 10 years? And I remember thinking, oh, my goodness, where do we begin? And yeah, I mean, I'm not working all the time. You know, it's a cave photographer. It's not 
a job that's in demand constantly, like a, you know, like a, I don't know, a wedding photographer, for example, um, which is good and and bad. Uh, it's good because you know you um, you couldn't really do it. I, I mean, these expeditions really take it out of me, and I'm glad that when I get back from an from an expedition somewhere, I have a week or two at least where I have to be tied to the computer because I have to edit and caption all the photographs that I've taken and create a, a portfolio that's uh, that's good enough for the, for the for the client for the magazine um and and yeah and since we've moved to to austria uh, innsbruck here i've taken up other thing taken up other sports such as skiing and and sledging which is another popular pastime so it's nice that we have this free time that i can do other things as well um yeah yeah so so typically in a year i would be away maybe i don't know 6 or 7 months of the year in i don't know eight different countries exploring caves so over the course of 10 years that's an awful lot of travel so it's you mentioned earlier that you make some sacrifices it also makes your your personal life difficult that's a long time to be away it is it is and i remember when uh, i was younger when i was interested in rock climbing i uh, i read a book uh, regions of the heart by uh, ed douglas and david rose all about the life of alison hargreaves and i remember one of the things that that fascinated me was the fact that there was this woman who had a huge burning ambition to climb mountains, um, but yet she had uh, two small children. And this was a, a source of debate in the book as well. And, and it was a source of uh, debate, unfortunately, after she died. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, it, I do think about this quite a lot. And I, I'm very fortunate that, you know, um, my partner also has a job where she has to travel around the world and um we do we we very rarely see each other um but but we have both at, up until this point um we we've chosen not to have children and we um you know you because it, it, it's a, it's a very selfish uh life really that we lead you know we 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 we're, we're doing what we want to do um and we 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 kind of don't want to put up put any obstacles in our way and and i do think that if for example if children came along um one of us certainly would have to would have to bend and change possibly even both because i i, I, w I wouldn't want to to, to do that to, uh, to to you know to the children yeah the reason i ask is uh, people are probably thinking oh right wow he goes to so many places he can't remember them all over the past 10 years when he's doing his russian visa that's not to give you a hard time but that's uh that's the reality of it. it's lots of travel it's exploration it's exciting it's flying on top of tapuis and helicopters but there's a downside as well. It's not all, it's not all great. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it's pretty great. It, 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 of course, it's pretty great. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not going to sit here and, and complain how, how bad my life is, Charlie. But, but, um, but yeah, there, there, there are sacrifices, and, and, and it's just it's timing. You know, I mean, at the moment, it's all it's all going well, and and, and it's it seems pretty cool. Um, and I kind of, I kind of want that to continue, but, uh, but of course, you know, who knows what life's going to throw, throw up in the future. Well, I'll tell you what. Just to finish, here's the acid test. If you won the lottery tomorrow, what would next year look like? Exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change this. I mean, it's, it's, it's not about that. It's not about money. That is wonderful to hear, Robbie. Thank you so much for your time, and hopefully, people listening might be a little more interested in uh, exploring below ground. Thank you very much, Charlie. So there you have it. Everything you never even realised you wanted to know about caving. It was a pleasure chatting to Robbie and I hope you enjoyed listening. If you want to see some of his staggering photographs, check out his website, www.shownphotography.com Shown is spelt S-H-O-N-E and his Instagram, at shownphoto. The Winning Mentality will be back next week, but in the meantime, leave us a review, post a comment, share the podcast, and tell your friends to listen. See you next week. <laughs>